Eastern Front. SS Commander Michael Wittmann is riding into the largest tank fight in history. The Battle of Kursk. dominate land warfare in World War II, and Wittmann commands the biggest yet built, the Titan. It's an awesome machine, and Wittmann will use it to become Germany's most celebrated and deadly tank ace. Today, only a priceless handful of Hitler's huge Tiger tanks remain. And just one reveals how they were put together. It's the only occasion you can see this tank and its pieces like a gigantic puzzle. Tank historian Ralf Raths is exploring Nazi Germany's entire super tanks program. Because thanks to Hitler, the awesome Tiger was just the beginning. Hitler himself was fascinated with big tanks, and he was the driving force behind them getting bigger and bigger. Hitler's obsession with giant tanks and big guns begins in World War I. As a corporal on the front line, he witnesses the power of heavy artillery firsthand. Hitler would have experienced this massive weight of firepower, this incessant shelling. This would have been something that would have been burned into his memory from his years as an infantryman. People tend to view the First World War as, as, the, as the war of the machine gun, but really more than anything else, it was the war of the artillery piece. Guns get bigger, they get heavier, they get longer range, throwing bigger and heavier projectiles further distances. In World War I, Hitler doesn't just watch artillery getting bigger. He sees it becoming more mobile. With the arrival of the first tank, Britain's Mark I. Here you are, a German infantryman in 1917, and over your trench looms this giant metal box, which is impervious to the light small arms that you've got with you. It must have been an extremely frightening experience the first time one of those tanks crossed over a trench. Fifteen years on, Hitler rises to power, promising to avenge the losses of World War I. But peace treaties ban Germany from building tanks, a must-have weapon for modern armies. So Hitler approves their development in secret. Today, hidden in thick pine forest, lies an abandoned Nazi military complex that once led the world in weapons development. This is the former HQ for Nazi black ops. Over 25 square kilometers of high-tech weapons labs and firing ranges, tank works and fuel dumps. Here, Nazi scientists created the world's first ballistic missiles. And it's also here that revolutionary tank legends will be born. Colonel Chris Wilbeck is a veteran of tank warfare in Iraq and a tank historian. This is where they conducted tests on their tanks, but it certainly has run down now, it's seen its better days. Tests performed here would transform Hitler's idea of how to fight a mobile ground war. It'd be uh, scary to get inside the mind of uh, Hitler, but um, he had to have been influenced by World War I, where he was a corporal that fought on the front lines and saw the horrors of that static, linear warfare. No one wanted to have another war like World War I. So everyone was thinking about what can the tank do to restore mobility to the battlefield so that you avoid that long, drawn-out, costly war.
At Kummersdorf in early 1935, Hitler is shown the first Nazi tank, the Panzer I. It can move at 39 kilometers per hour, eight times faster than the tanks Hitler saw in World War I. When he was presented with a display of what tanks could do uh, here at Kummersdorf, he had to be impressed. This is it. This is what I want. Hitler's new panzers promise unprecedented mobility on the battlefield. But there's a problem. The panzers that so impress Hitler are really tiny. They're six foot high, they're only armed with machine guns. Um, there's two men in them. But very quickly, they realize that, that these tanks are just not going to cut it in a modern war. Between 1934 and 1939, Nazi Germany produces a series of bigger panzers with bigger guns. The Panzer II gets a cannon, and then the Panzer III gets a, a slightly bigger cannon, and the Panzer IV is a yet bigger cannon than that. So uh, they go from, say, 5.8 tons, which is the size of the, uh, the Panzer I, to 20 tons, which is the size of the Panzer IV. In just five years, Hitler's Panzers quadruple in size. No longer a secret, the Panzers are about to go into action for the first time. In September 1939, these tanks smash into Poland, kick-starting World War II. The unprecedented speed and power of Panzer warfare spawns a new word, Blitzkrieg, Lightning War. The genius behind the Nazis' successful blitzkrieg tactics is General Heinz Guderian. This landscape is perfect. Yes, sir! Hands in the middle, grenadiers left and right. Yes, sir! Guderian's success is about far more than cutting-edge machinery. The point about the Panzer arm is it's not just the tank. The tank is the visual expression of that. You know, when, when you see the film footage, what you see is the tank. But actually, what makes them effective is the whole package. It's, it's the communication ability. It's the cooperation with the air forces, with artillery, with infantry. That's what makes the Panzer Arm effective, not the individual tanks on their own. Darien's blitzkrieg tactics are successful pretty much from the beginning of the Second World War. They punch big holes into the Polish lines. They punch big holes into the French lines. The French are simply not capable of keeping up with the fast-moving German way of warfare. Part of this seemingly unstoppable force is 27-year-old Michael Wittmann. farmer's son who has risen through the ranks of the SS. He's forging a reputation as a commander with an uncanny knack for killing the enemy. In 1941, he's part of an unstoppable German army that conquers huge swathes of Europe. Now Hitler turns his tanks east for the invasion of the Soviet Union. Operation Barbarossa. When Barbarossa commences, the world will hold its breath and make no comment. We have only to kick in the door and the whole rotten structure will come crashing down. The Fuhrer masses the largest invasion force in history on the Soviet frontier. 3,600 tanks and 4 million men. Confidence among the Panzer Arm is enormous. And who are they up against? They're up against the Red Army, who propaganda has portrayed for years, ever since the Nazis took power, as being a bunch of sort of redneck peasants, Bolsheviks who know nothing. And it's going to be a walk in the park. On the 22nd of June, 1941, Germany invades. 
Within hours, they make a shocking discovery. The Soviets have a much better tank. The T-34. In previous battles across Europe, Hitler's armored units have destroyed everything in their path. The T-34 is heavier, faster, with better armor, and packs a bigger punch than the latest Panzers. Hitler is going to need some bigger tanks. German engineers are searching for a weapon that can eliminate the threat posed by Soviet T-34 tanks. And they find it in the form of a gun called the Flak 88. Originally designed to shoot down planes, this weapon will one day sit on the first Nazi super tank. We need a bigger gun. I've said this before. Do not try to trick me. We need a tank with an 88. If the Germans mount the Flak 88 on a Panzer, it'll be the biggest gun ever put on a tank. But adding a gun this size will add huge amounts of weight. Deciding for an 8.8-centimeter uh, gun was also deciding for a heavy tank, because you need a big heavy tank to transport this gun. This new super tank will be very different from the Panzers that came before. It'll be given a name, the Tiger. The development of the Tiger is a major turning point, because it marks the point where the Germans suddenly go, yes, big is good when it comes to armor. Hitler's new monster will be the biggest tank the war has seen. Now, he needs someone to design it. His first choice is a 66-year-old car designer named Ferdinand Porsche. Porsche has never built a tank before and is best known for something rather smaller, the Volkswagen Beetle. Hitler admired Porsche because he thought that he was a technical genius. Maybe the biggest technical genius of the time. Shortly after Hitler came to power, Porsche and Hitler met, and Porsche uh, introduced his ideas of a sports car. That car was very successful at the time, and it raced around here. This is the former Avis racetrack, Berlin. Here in the 1930s, Porsche's sports cars showcased German engineering excellence and delighted Hitler. That led to a commission to build the Beetle, Nazi Germany's people's car. Creating the biggest tank of the war is a very different challenge. Of course, looking at these two vehicles, the difference couldn't be bigger. This Volkswagen here was designed to serve the people, the simple people, if you will, and the other one was designed to kill the simple people. Porsche must go from making family cars to a killing machine. Hitler and the Nazis said, go ahead, let's make a real a monster of a tank. Porsche said, OK, let's do it. But even for can-do Dr. Korsch, putting together a monster tank won't be easy. Today, at an old flower warehouse in Switzerland, an exceptionally rare Tiger II tank is being rebuilt from scratch. For tank historian Ralph Raths, it offers an unprecedented chance to see firsthand the challenges facing Porsche. That's a very impressive sight. Porsche's Tiger will have thousands of precision parts, many hand-tooled. The main cause for its size and complexity is the gun. If you build a big gun and it shoots, it will go back through the recoil. So if the gun goes back into the turret, it needs space. So you have to make the turret bigger 
so that the gun has the room to go back. So if you start to make the gun bigger, everything else will get bigger accordingly. To carry the 88 millimeter gun, the Tiger will be more than twice the size of any previous Panzer and weigh 60 tons. The pressure on Porsche is compounded by the announcement that a rival German engineering giant, Henschel, will also make a prototype. The successful model will result in a massive contract for the winning designer. The Henschel engineers took the classical path. They put an engine in the back of the tank, a transmission through the whole tank, and then generating power on the axle of the tank um, via torque on the tracks. That's a classical way to um, power a German tank. Porsche, on the other hand, used a combined diesel-electro uh, engine, meaning that he had a uh, diesel engine powering two electromotors on each track separately, which had the great advantage that there was no transmission needed at all. Porsche's system does away with mechanical gears, which are heavy and take up valuable space. It's a bold, visionary idea that won't be adopted for mass-produced cars until the 1990s. But will it work on a revolutionary new tank? Hitler's 53rd birthday. His treat? To watch demonstrations of the two rival Tiger prototypes. Porsche's so confident his version will get the Führer's approval that he's already building 100 chassis. When Porsche and Henschel presented their prototypes on Hitler's birthday in 1942, um, the classical conservative design of Henschel proved very well on the testing fields. They drove around, they did everything they were asked for. The machine worked. Oh, it's just the electrics. Uh, it is not a problem. The Porsche Tiger, on the other hand, went up in flames internally and didn't accomplish anything on the testing field. So the decision was quite clear. Porsche's innovative tank is a failure. His engine is too complicated and suffers repeated fires. Porsche's idea were intelligent and clever and interesting, but the Henschel design, on the other hand, worked. It is Henschel's Tiger that will go into production. The Tiger is more than twice the size of the main Soviet tank, the T-34. It's also precision engineered by hand and even comes with its own operator's manual. They produced this richly illustrated and very well written manual um, for the Tiger crews so that each and every man on the Tiger knew what he had to do in his function on the Tiger. To grab attention, the Tiger manual includes pictures of scantily clad women and armaments minister Albert Speer telling gunners not to waste ammunition. It also features clever tips on how to deal with the tank's exceptional weight. It says if you're not sure if your Tiger is too heavy for the ground, uh, take a comrade, put him on your back, go to the place you're unsure about and stand on one leg. If you don't sink into the ground, um, the, the ground pressure of your Tiger is okay with that ground. If you sink in, your Tiger is too heavy. So the heaviness is a problem, but they also provide the solutions for the, for the simple man at the front, how to decide what to do. The Tiger is an expensive sledgehammer built to smash Soviet lines. Now Hitler will test it in combat at the largest tank battle in history. But will his decision to go big pay off? Spring, 1943. The Russian front. The German forces are preparing to attack a 200-kilometer bulge around the city of Kursk. The reason the Germans want to do this to, to attack here is twofold. First, because they want to reduce the front by 170 miles. The main reason is to take on the biggest concentration of Soviet forces head on and hopefully defeat them. Everyone knows.
realize that this is a pivotal moment in the war. If the Germans lost at Kursk, their ambitions on the Eastern Front were over. But Hitler is racked with doubt. Does he have enough Tigers? He delays for two months so more can be made, allowing huge Soviet defenses to gather. The scene is set for the biggest tank battle in history. Leading the charge will be 29-year-old Michael Wittmann. This dedicated commander has spent three months training with his new Tiger. He knows that its armor gives him a huge advantage over T-34s half the size. They can't pierce our armor unless they get within 600 meters. Should we keep our distance from the enemy tanks? No, give it the gas and let them have it. But, but that means... Give it the gas and let them have it. On the 5th of July, 1943, Hitler finally gives the order to attack. It's the moment of truth for the Tigers. Wittmann has destroyed 15 enemy tanks and anti-tank guns. Hitler's Tiger is a deadly success. They need us! He's turning to fire! In terms of uh, effectiveness uh, of killing enemy tanks, of destroying enemy tanks, the Tiger was very effective. The uh, kill ratios were for very high. After five days fighting, the Tiger helps German forces advance up to 30 kilometers. But despite the carnage, the Soviet T-34s keep coming. The problems the Germans have on the Eastern Front is just the vast numbers they come up against. It seems to be never-ending. It's sort of a bit like the Hydra's head. You chop one off and six more appear. Lieutenant, there are thousands of them. Listen to my orders, repeat them, otherwise stay silent. Concentrate, that way we might stay alive. While Germany is creating their hand-built masterpiece, Soviet tractor factories have been churning out thousands of T-34s. The high-tech Tiger is massively outnumbered. It's also worryingly high maintenance. It was very mechanically complex. It was also very heavy, which meant that it had problems with its engine, transmission, and suspension which uh, caused it to have lots of breakdowns. Like many of the Tigers sent to Kursk, Wittmann's tank is not being defeated by the enemy, but by its own complex engineering. German records indicate that uh, about as many tanks were destroyed by their own crews to avoid capture after they'd broken down or been damaged than were engaged and destroyed by enemy fire. Germany has too few Tigers to break through Soviet lines 100 kilometers deep. After losing 54,000 men and over 250 armored vehicles, 
Hitler abandons the Kursk offensive. Kursk is the last time the Germans go forward on the Eastern Front. It's the last time they go forward in Soviet territory. From then on, they're always on the back foot. Building the biggest tank of the war has not bought Hitler victory on the battlefield. Yet Nazi Germany celebrates the achievements of their new super tank and its heroic commanders like Michael Wittmann. Nazi Germany is a highly militarized society and individuals are fated in a way that they're not really in America and certainly not in Britain, for example. So the cult of the ace is, is a big thing. So how is it possible for one man to destroy 117 tanks? What is your secret? Concentration, my führer. And the hunter's instinct, I suspect. So, how are things at the front? Are the Tigers everything you had hoped for? The Tiger is the very best tank in the world. In open country, the enemy flees as soon as he sees us. Despite losing the Battle of Kursk, the successes of individual Tigers convince Hitler that big is better. To him, the next step is logical. Germany will build the first true mega tank. The idea of a mega tank ranging somewhere between 100 and 250 tons was circulating in the whole continent of Europe for about 30 years. Nearly every major land had uh, one or two designs of this in their drawers. Now, designers bombard the Führer with rival plans, including a jaw-dropping design, 10 times larger than any tank in existence. The largest Nazi tank design, known as the Landkreuzer, is dreamt up by a submarine designer at Krupp Steel. Krupp has suggested to me a magnificent tank, a thousand-ton monster with a battleship gun. We can use it to replace destroyed defense bunkers. Get her go to Herr Krupp on the telephone. This is the only plan that exists of this vehicle. If you look at this design and consider all dimensions, it's basically a ship on land, the height of this tank would be 11 meters. That's roughly the size of a four-story house. And the overall length of the whole design would be up to 39 meters. The Landkreuzer is a tank supersized beyond practical use. Realizing this, Armaments Minister Albert Speer shuts the project down. But Hitler's desire to build a mega tank is unstoppable. He turns to Dr. Porsche. This legendary car designer failed in his bid to build the Tiger. But now, he has a shot at redemption. He still believed that Porsche was basically a genius. And maybe this time, something very good, something very new would come out with far more battlefield um, power than the other classical designs. And what would be the purpose of such a tank? Nothing could stop a land battleship of this size. Of course, it would not travel alone, but with an escort of smaller armored vehicles. It also seems to me we could use some steel bunkers. Suppose one of our concrete bunkers was knocked out. This steel monster could quickly plug the gap again and again. This new steel monster will be called the Mouse. It's a monumental engineering challenge, and Porsche cannot afford to let his Führer down again. Everything Porsche had to build into this tank, according to the demands of Hitler, was a problem on a much, much bigger scale than before. This is the first design Porsche proposed in June 1942. It's the classical German tank on a new scale. The whole thing was roughly double the size of a Tiger, but it still wasn't enough for Hitler. With Porsche failing to deliver the colossal scale he wants, Hitler gets even more hands-on. He specifies the exact length and diameter of the gun and the thickness of the armor for his dream tank. So this is the final mouse. And this design now, with the demands Hitler made over the time, um, weighs in at 188 tons. This means the first mouse was as heavy as two Tigers, 
and they added just a third tiger. On the 14th of May, 1943, Hitler and Porsche gather at the wolf's lair to view a wooden model mouse. After disappointing Hitler with his tiger prototype, Porsche knows another failure could be disastrous. So, can we build such tanks? Of course, mein Führer, we can build such tanks. We must now plan ahead for achieving superiority in 1944. This year, the Tiger and the Panther are the best. Next year, the Mouse and the Tiger too must be the best. This is fantastic. The giant Mouse is irresistible to Hitler. Porsche's super tank will be built. Everything he does leads towards vastness. Vast underground bunkers. Vast guns. Vast tanks. Hitler absolutely buys into the idea that big is better. But creating this giant tank presents Porsche with huge technical challenges. The Germans had tried building a massive mobile gun several years earlier. A weapon called the Schwer Gustav, which dwarfed Porsche's vision for the mouse. It's a valuable lesson in the pitfalls of building big. A piece of this gun still survives. One of its shells. What strikes me first when I look at this, this grenade is the enormous size of it. Uh, almost four meters long, it weighs about 5,000 kilograms. It could inflict enormous damage. It could penetrate 10 meters concrete. It could penetrate a steel plate of a meter thick. When this thing fired, you got firepower in need. Completed in 1942, the Gustav weighed over 1,300 tons. The gun was so big that the only way to move it was on its own dedicated railway. And transporting it to the battlefront was a mammoth undertaking. It took 25 trains to bring all the equipment, all the installations of the Schwere Gustav. It took about two to three months before it was ready to fire in June 1942. There were 2,500 people needed to build the tracks for the gun, to assemble the gun and to fire the gun. Once in position, the Gustav required vast amounts of manpower and resources to operate. The giant gun couldn't swivel so new railway tracks were laid to point it in the right direction. In all, it took 90 days to prepare the gun for firing. And it was only used once, against the Soviet city of Sevastopol. It was able to destroy some heavy fortifications, but at a price. It could fire 48 shots, and then its barrel was worn out, worn out completely. Propelling its five-ton shells at supersonic speeds had wrecked the barrel. It needs enormous man maintenance to keep it in working order. And because of its dimensions, of course, it's very vulnerable to air attacks. Was the Swede Gustav a successful weapon? In the end, you have to answer no. When building the mouse, Porsche has to mount a large gun on the biggest tank ever built. Unlike the Gustav, though, it has to be practical and maneuverable. And, crucially, it must deliver Hitler the lethal killing power he craves. The Fuhrer desperately needs weapons that can reverse the crushing losses in Russia. Weapons capable of striking fear into his enemies. Most Germans know that the war is not going to be won from 1943 onwards. But Hitler is still clinging on to this thousand-year Reich concept. And because he's always been such a technology buff, he starts to put increased amount of faith in wonder weapons. You know, whether they be rockets or jet aircraft or even, you know, mouse tanks. Kummersdorf, Germany. It's here that Hitler's giant mouse prototypes will be stored. 
1935, at this top-secret base, Hitler had been wowed by Panzer I's weighing six tons. This is it. This is what I want. Now, Kummersdorf will house a tank 36 times bigger. This building is, uh, is the building that housed the two German Panzer VII's, the Maus. This was where, where all of their new weapons were tested and, uh, and uh, made sure that they met the specifications. Uh, but just the sheer size of uh, where they parked these tanks is, is really impressive to see. Hitler and the Nazis have high hopes for the mouse tanks stored here. They were hoping that uh, this would be a wonder weapon, that this would be of such, you know, a large moving fortress that could uh, defeat anything in its path. But before Hitler can use the mouse in combat, its inventor, Dr. Porsche, must get it mobile. Despite his disaster with the Tiger tank, he still has faith in his pioneering diesel electric engine. Tests could prove him right. The pressure on the tracks was so good, so, so well distributed on the ground, that the tank actually was able to reach 15 to 20 kilometers per hour on the, on the open terrain. Porsche managed to design the interior of the mouse so that this humongous, cumbersome, real, real big tank moves like a normal car, basically. And everybody who could drive a car could basically drive a mouse. From an engineering point of view, regarding this, the steering of the mouse, it's a masterpiece. Porsche's mouse is a technical triumph, but possibly not the most practical combat vehicle. Every bridge the mouse would have tried to go over would have been broken down by it, so the mouse had to go through rivers. For that, you had to build a snorkel on the mouse, keep every hole in the mouse shut, and connect it to another mouse, because a mouse had this typical Porsche diesel electromotor, which wasn't able to function underwater. The mouse would go through the water, and then the mouse on the other side would give her energy to the second mouse, which go through the water then. On dry land, the mouse proves an astonishing gas guzzler. It burns a liter of diesel every 30 meters, at a time when fuel is increasingly scarce. The Nazi high command are divided about whether to go into full production. But the war won't wait. In June 1944, the Allies invade Normandy. Within a week, they've advanced deep inland. To fight back, the Nazis must rely on their original super tank, the Tiger. And aces like Michael Widmer. Near a village called Villers Bocage, Wittmann is sent to observe Allied tank movements. They think they have won the war already. Let's prove them wrong. Wittmann has found an entire tank formation napping. He decides to attack with just one Tiger. He just goes down on a power load and just goes boom. Ah! Boom. Boom. Ah! boom. Taking out one after another. And the space of 15 minutes in his own tank has destroyed, uh, has taken out between 12 and 13 British tanks and the same number again of, of, of vehicles. It's one of the most devastating single handed attacks of the war and earns ice-cold tank ace Wittmann even greater fame in Nazi Germany. People like Wittmann did something good for their army concerning morale, um, but then again, they actually distracted from the truth of the industrial warfare. Germany simply hasn't built enough tanks. In World War II, they produced over 1,300 Tigers, compared to 50,000 Shermans built by the United States. 2,000 of these Shermans are given extra big guns to destroy Tigers. They are called Sherman Fireflies. 
The genius idea about the Firefly is you're using the same tank that's already in mass production. So to support it, you don't need any new spare parts because it's using two things that are already in existence. A 17-pounder gun, which the artillery have, and a Sherman tank. The Firefly will prove Wittmann's nemesis. On the 8th of August, 1944, a Firefly gunner spots Wittmann's distant Tiger. Just one shot penetrates the Tiger's armor, ignites its ammo, and incinerates Wittmann and his crew. What Wittmann's death tells us is that this idea of building super heavy, super complicated wonder weapon tanks didn't work out because the Americans just took their normal mass-produced medium tank, improved it, and killed Whitman and his tiger. As the Allies close in from east and west, defeat for Nazi Germany creeps nearer. At Kummersdorf, Ferdinand Porsche continues to test his mouse. But only two prototypes are ever made and the mouse halls are never finished. The mouse was a marketing trick. It was to keep people uh, believing in, in this silly war, in this vicious war, even when everything was lost. And it was obvious to everybody that things are lost. In March 1945, the Soviets reached Germany and discovered two abandoned mouse tanks close to Kummersdorf. They would go on to test the mouse, but concluded that it had little practical use. No tank this big would ever be built again. I would say that the mouse was, a, was an evolutionary dead end in terms of tank development because it didn't have the mobility necessary to accomplish really anything practical on the modern battlefield. The mouse, like the Gustav gun, was a weapon supersized far beyond the practical. The result of Hitler's love of the very, very big. <laughs>